on this edition of Paint Your Engine, it's not one engine, but a trial of four in the same poster, commemorating 100 years of the Big Four. Before we start though, I'd just like to give a thank you to everybody who's been supporting me on Patreon recently. If you really do like this series of videos and you'd like to help it continue, then please feel free to at least consider becoming a patron from as little as £3.50 a month. It really does help. Now let's make this a window of four, seeing as we've got four types of engine to have a go at. Now when I say the big four, I am of course talking about the UK's four major railway companies, the London and North Eastern, London Midland and Scottish, Great Western and Southern Railways. So if you're hoping for something on banks or supermarkets, you've come to the wrong video. And seeing as it came into effect in 1923, each company will be represented by a flagship loco that appeared in 1923. Why am I doing this like an abstract Beatles album cover? Well, it's nice to have a Beatles song going number one in 2023 amongst whatever music's being played today, so why not? Combining railway companies under the same banner wasn't exactly a new concept by 1923. Railway mania of the 1840s and 50s sprung up masses of private companies, some of which barely got off the ground before they were swallowed up by a rival firm, while others, like the South Eastern and Chatham, were formed of two opposing firms competing for the same kind of traffic over different routes. The grouping came about by Act of Parliament. There were more than 120 railway companies under government control in the UK after World War I. And with road competition becoming a threat, the Prime Minister enacted a mass amalgamation of constituent companies to prevent further competition and reduce their losses. The Great Western was the only one of these companies to retain its original name, merging companies from South Wales, the West Midlands and companies west of Bristol and Exeter, they retained their original terminus in Paddington, where there had been a station since 1838. Now, enginemen of old have sometimes said that in terms of engineering, the Great Western built sailing galleons to their end. But in 1923, they were arguably about to enter the top of their game with the launch of the Castle Class 460s in August that year. The LMS, by comparison, was by far the biggest of the Big Four, with just shy of 7,800 miles of track to run and maintain. It was predominantly made up of the Midland, London Northwestern, and Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Companies. The latter pair had already merged in 1922. In Scotland, the Highland and Caledonian Railways were also LMS constituents. With that being said, while it ran trains out of St Pancras and Euston stations, it started off, politically, a Midland-operated line, with Midland locomotive designs being adopted as LMS standards, and a tendency to run frequent short trains with the likes of 440s which Fowler, a former Midland man, carried on building from the Johnson and Dealey era. This absolutely strangled them very quickly, despite the fact they already had a far more capable engine for long-distance working, the LNWR Clawton 460s. A similar but not quite as vicious thing happened with the London and North Eastern Railway. A great Northern Railway engineer named Nigel Gresley, you might have heard of him, was appointed the railway's CME, while the company took control of the Great Central, Great Eastern, North Eastern, North British and Great North of Scotland Railways. Things got off to a rough start with the LNER though. Their new Pacifics of Great Northern origin, like the one I'm painting here, were initially plagued by poor steaming, and while the North Eastern Railway built some electric rolling stock and infrastructure, the powers that be had too many stakes invested in coal. The Southern took the South Eastern and Chatham, London and South Western, London Brighton and South Coast, and whatever lines were running on the Isle of Wight by that point. By this time, they had a former SECR engineer, Richard Maunsell, as their CME. Yet Maunsell continued building London and South Western designs, such as the Uri N15 and S15 class 460s, which inevitably led to the Lord Nelsons of 1927. The Southern also ended up focusing on electrification, with long-term plans to turn over the whole Southern Railway network by 1963. Unfortunately, while the grouping seemed a great idea on paper, all four companies took a financial battering. The LMS and LNER might have been investing in flashy new high-speed rolling stock, but changing times took their toll. The Wall Street crash and road traffic competition began to make railways a difficult business to be in. The LNER's financial situation was terrible, and by 1938, the LMS's president, Lord Stamp, was calling for government support. But no thanks to Hitler, that support didn't come. 
After World War II, things went from bad to worse. Six years of heavy traffic and a desperate need for reinvestment pretty much broke the railway's back. The grouping era finally came to an end on the 1st of January 1948, when the four private companies were brought under the public ownership of British Railways. It's amazing to find that 100 years later, the names of three of these companies have come full circle. We've got an LNER, GWR and Southern, though the nearest we've got to an LMS is the new London Northwestern. As for the reputation of these modern companies, well, least said about the state of Britain's railways today, probably the better. Still, at least the journey times have gotten quicker. Some of them, allegedly. So there we are. I hope you enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed painting it. If you like what you see and you'd like to see more, then please feel free to like, share, subscribe, discuss, contribute to Steam Locos in profile on Patreon, and why not have a go yourself? Why not paint your engine?